Hello, friends, and welcome to our first webisode on tips and techniques for business process change. I'm Alex Sharp, and I'm going to share with you some of the lessons I've learned in 40 years of running my own consulting business. We'll do that through a series of short presentations. We began this with a webinar in April on business process change, about 45 minutes. And if you haven't watched it, I really recommend that you do because it introduces many of the concepts, the frameworks, the techniques, and the terms that we will use throughout this series. We closed that webinar with a poll question to find out what topics are of most interest to you. And by an overwhelming majority, you wanted the first webisode to be on discovering your organization's business processes. Now, most of the literature suggests a top-down approach. Go to the big picture and then add progressive levels of detail and elaboration. I certainly do that, especially on larger assignments, but I'm also well aware of some of the, of the problems with a top-down approach. For instance, top-down often leads to processes that look suspiciously like your organization chart, and that is not a good thing. Also, it's not necessarily easy for the business people whose involvement we need to pull back to that 30,000 foot view. So more typically, I begin with a bottom-up approach. I start with familiar, recognizable detail, synthesize it up into the big picture, and then proceed top-down. So everybody likes an example. Let's look at one. I was working at a financial services company on the East Coast, and they were very interested in improving their commercial loans processes, large loans to big commercial enterprises. And they had identified several of their business processes, but to me, they looked dubious. They looked like pieces of processes or functional areas, and they all suffered from poor naming. In the webinar, I stressed we always use active verb and noun naming for processes or activities or tasks with no reference yet to who or how, because that drags you into the details. So solicitation doesn't look like a verb and noun, but it's a good start because solicit is an active verb to engage someone's interest. So the question becomes solicit what? What is the noun that you are soliciting? The answer came back instantly. We are soliciting a prospect, a potential new customer. Perfectly reasonable, but somebody else in the room immediately said, mm, we do solicitation and we're soliciting a loan payment. This demonstrated to the clients the value of this rigorous naming format, rigorous but easy, so they had no trouble then identifying 12 or so verb-noun pairs that described what goes on in commercial loans. Each of these produces an essential result. For instance, register customer leads to the result, a customer is registered, and each of these is recognizable. And by that I mean Everybody in the room could look at this and say, I recognize my day-to-day -day work in there. So, what next? Well, we started off with something that was easy enough for the client, identifying these activities. We carried on in that vein by putting those activities into sequence. And simply getting people together and manipulating the media was a learning experience. They saw, for instance, where they had confused the sequence, where they needed to rename an activity. Most important, everybody was learning what their colleagues in other departments were actually doing. Now, I need to point out this is an unusual example in that it is a linear chain of activities. Normally, you will see branching into parallel change, chains, merging, and so on. Now, is this one big process? Is this 12 processes? To discover this, we're going to apply the TRAC framework that I introduced in the webinar. TRAC stands for Trigger, Result, Activity, and Case. The basic way you describe a business process. 
So we're going to go ahead and do this. But first, I want to remind you, this was all done with post-its and flip charts. In the virtual world we all find ourselves in nowadays, Lucidchart makes an ideal virtual whiteboard. So using track to discover the processes, the boundaries between chains of activities that make up a process. And I'm going to start with looking for results because that's what a process exists for, to deliver a result. In the session, I refer to them as happiness points. So the first happiness point was when we have registered a new customer. All of these activities are leading up to the customer being happy because they have an account and the bank being happy because they have a new customer. Then the next chain of activities begins with a loan application and ends up at the happiness point where the customer finds loan funds are available and the bank has a performing asset on the books, and so on. Now, something interesting is happening at this point here, just after we have achieved a happiness point. And what's going on is we have a chain of activities where each activity triggers the next. So to complete identify prospect, triggers qualify prospect. And that in turn triggers us to solicit a prospect. And if the solicitation is successful, that triggers us to register the prospect. But that does not trigger the receipt of a loan application. That only happens when the customer makes a decision to seek loan financing. And that's why the second thing I go looking for is points where we can't proceed any further until a triggering event outside the organization's control happens. And that will usually be decision, or as in the next one, time, a temporal event, or as in the next one, a data-driven or conditional event. In this case, zero balance. So now we've identified almost all the triggers. The, tr the client struggled with this one a bit, but we sorted that out later. What next? Well, an interesting technique, we look at the cardinality, the ratio with which these activities relate one to another. So one instance of identifying a prospect leads to one instance of qualifying a prospect. That in turn leads to one instance of soliciting the prospect. And again, if that is successful, one solicit prospect leads to one registered customer. But we hope that a registered customer will generate multiple loan applications over time. Then we have another chain of one-to-one -one activities leading up to a result. And we know that that loan is going to take many payments uh, to, to service it. And then we have another chain of one-to-one -one activities. And finally, it's going to take many payments before we can settle the loan. Final technique that we're going to employ is to look for the tokens. The token is the work item that the process works on transforming or changing its state. And the first one is customer transforming from a prospect to registered. The next is the loan going from applied to booked, then a payment, and then the loan again. It's really starting to look like we have identified four business processes. One, two, three, and four. And the client agreed and named them as you see. Now, this is starting to get a little bit busy, so let's just go back, look at this. This is our working papers, but what it led up to was this view, the, the, the almost highest level view of what our processes are. And we got here by applying objective tests and criteria. And the client had faith that these were their processes because they identified the activities and then they synthesized them and they determined where the boundaries were. So really great start, high engagement. And we are gonna close here with five guidelines for well-formed processes. The first three I've already talked about extensively, but I want to stress 
these last two because they resonate particularly well with business people. Frankly, much to my surprise. So the first one is the idea that activities that are linked one-to-one are probably part of the same process, but as soon as we have a one-to-many or many-to-one connection, that is probably a process boundary. And the final guideline, also that resonates well with clients, is the idea that the same token, the customer, the loan, the payment, and the loan again, flows through the entire process, changing state, but between processes, there will be a change of token from customer to loan, from loan to payment, and from payment back to loan again. So, clear objective guidelines, science, not just opinion. So what next? Well, we're going to continue our bottom-up journey up to the highest level by simplifying this and representing it as what we call a process landscape. That's the big picture, our highest level framework. Then we're going to proceed top-down with rigor and elaboration. So for instance, acquire customer was refined and the clients in the room clarified what is the process, they added some activities, they split some activities, and they ended up with a cleaner process scope model. And that sets us up entirely well for going into swim lane diagramming. Let's take a look at what we've done. We started bottom up with some granular activities which we synthesized up into the big picture. From this point, we're going top down, elaborating and refining until we get down to the level of our individual who does what when swim lane diagram. So there is a quick summary of how to use a bottom-up approach to discovering your processes. Here's my contact detail. Feel free to contact me with questions or comments, and please tune in for our next webinar where we'll look at four techniques for discovering those activities that drive your bottom-up approach. Thanks for being with us. I hope you all learned something useful.